Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 99. And this time we're going to talk about Carol King's wonderful album from 1971, Tapestry. And what I have here is a Canadian reissue from the early 1970s, but not from 1971. The needlework which uh, Carol was doing and the picture of Carol in her living room in her house in Laurel Canyon at that time with her cat and her feet and so on and all the lyrics in the background anyway beautifully packaged album. So Carol King is born Carol Joan Klein in Manhattan in 1942. Growing up she was excellent at verbal and mathematical skills. She was a musical prodigy. She had perfect pitch. Uh, in the early 1950s, she changed her name to Carol King as she began to write songs and get a bit of traction. She, at the time, was a friend of Paul Simon, and they cut some demos together, which never really went anywhere. She signed her first contract at age 15 with ABC Paramount, and quite shortly thereafter, she records her first single, which is called The Right Girl. doesn't really make any indent on the charts. With her music career not really taking off, she goes off to college. She meets a guy called Jerry Goffin, and they form a songwriting partnership. She writes the music, he writes the lyrics. They're also in a romantic relationship. Carol gets pregnant, and they get married in 1959. So they've got a young baby. They have this songwriting partnership where they have their day jobs, and then they write songs around the kitchen table and the piano in the evening. And pretty soon they have success, major success, because their song, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, is recorded by the Shirelles and goes to number one. They're working at this point for a music publishing company called Alden Music, which is part of the whole pop industry in and around the Brill Building at 1619 Broadway in Manhattan. Key to all this is a guy called Don Kirshner, who would go on to some kind of fame in the 1970s with the syndicated show Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. His claim to fame at this point was being a major music publisher, maybe the major music publisher in the Brill Building, and he would have armies of songwriters all pitted against each other, all trying to write a song for the next day, which would then get pitched or auditioned in front of the producers of whatever artist was cutting a single that particular week. So Goffin and King are part of this world, and they become almost the poster children for the Brill Building machinery of pushing out great pop music in the 1960s. They wrote Chains, which was recorded by the Beatles, Locomotion, which was done by Little Eva, I'm Into Something Good, Herman's Hermits, One Fine Day by the Chiffons, and maybe their crowning achievement in the later part of the 60s, You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, which was written for originally Aretha Franklin. Carol's relationship with Jerry Goffin hits the bricks relatively early on. In 1964, he ends up fathering a child with somebody else. He then gets very 1960s, he gets very into psychedelics into LSD, mescaline and so on, and starts to tune in, turn on and drop out. Pretty challenging if you're actually trying to raise a family with a guy like that. Anyway, eventually they get divorced. Carol moves with her two young daughters out to LA and she moves to Laurel Canyon where she makes all kinds of friends who would end up being extraordinarily influential in her career and very influential and in fact participants on this album. And that includes people like James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, and also a woman called Toni Stern, who became a lyricist and songwriting partner. In Laurel Canyon, she starts to get more spiritual. She starts to follow a Swami, a Satchidananda, who incidentally was also the same Swami who Alice Coltrane was a big fan of and about whom Alice Coltrane named an album, Journey to Satchidananda. Anyway, Carol was one of his devotees as well. She also got heavily into yoga, not just doing it, but actually teaching it. And so at the time this album was made, she was also teaching yoga at the Integral Yoga Center in Laurel Canyon. She hooks up with a couple musicians, a guy called Danny Korchmar, known as Cooch, and another guy called Charles Larkey. She'd eventually get married to Larkey. Together they form a trio called The City. They put out one album called Now That Everything's Been Said, which doesn't do a whole ton of sales, largely if not entirely because Carol had stage fright and did not want to tour. And in those days, you really had to tour to sell albums. But as I mentioned, she's also hanging out with and interacting with James Taylor and Joni Mitchell in particular. And Taylor is encouraging her to write her own music, play her own music, and sing her own songs. And he's really insistent about this. And she begins to take this on and starts to think of herself purely as a solo artist and releases a solo record. So her first solo record is called Writer. That's released in 1970. It does okay, goes to number 84, but gathering more material and feeling more inspired, more confident, she heads back into the studio in 1971 to make Tapestry. So King records this album at A&M Studios in Hollywood, and she does so in their Studio B. In Studio A are the Carpenters. In Studio C, Joni Mitchell, right next door, is making her 
legendary album Blue. Kind of mind-blowing to think of this album and Blue basically being recorded at the same time. Tapestry was produced by a guy called Lou Adler, who had been Carol's publisher for a number of years in the 1960s already. Adler wanted the album to sound like the demos that Carol made for other artists. Unstudied, unaffected, sort of honest nature of the singing with the piano accompaniment. And what he wanted was an album which was that. And that's very much what you get on Tapestry. In terms of personnel, I think I've mentioned that James Taylor plays guitar here. He also does some backup singing along with Joni Mitchell. Danny Korchmar and Charles Larkey, who had been with Carole King both in The City, that trio, but also on her first album, Writer, also make appearances. And there are a variety of other session players who make contributions here. Side One starts with a one, two, three punch of absolutely incredible songs that really would have made this a legendary album if there were nothing else on it at all. And the first of those is I Feel the Earth Move Under My Feet. This is a song which Carol wrote about an earthquake which had happened not long before. Like so many other songs in this album, this song is full of hooks. It has that great opening riff on piano, which Carol plays. It also has that great descending vocal bit at the end of the chorus, which I'm convinced the Bee Gees lifted for Staying Alive. That's followed by So Far Away, a beautiful slow ballad written by King. The third of those three famous songs which kicked the album off is It's Too Late. This is a song which Carol co-writes with Tony Stern about a relationship which has seen better days and kind of a wry, wistful, rueful kind of a lyric. Followed by Home Again, which is a beautiful ballad, and then a song called Beautiful, which was never released as a single, but which became much beloved by her fans. It was eventually used as a title of a musical about Carol King's life in recent years. The final track on side one is Way Over Yonder, which is this superb, gospel tune with Mary Clayton, she who sang Back Up on the Stones' Gimme Shelter, just an incredible singer, on Back Up. This is another song which I think Carol could have pitched to Aretha if she didn't want to record it herself. It's just stunning. Side two starts with a song which James Taylor recorded at exactly the same time, which of course Carol wrote, You've Got a Friend. His version goes to number one. Hers doesn't do as well, although I think I like her version a lot better. I find the emotion in this song really raw, really touching. I get goosebumps whenever I hear her sing it. Just excellent. The next song is Where You Lead, and this song was co-written again with Tony Stern. Stern listened to the song and felt that the lyrics were kind of obsequious and kind of little womanish. Stern wanted to write a more assertive lyric from the woman's point of view, so the lines she writes for the bridge are, if you want to live in fucking New York City, honey, you know I will. King loves the lyric, but doesn't think that the profanity is going to fly, so she excises that. Anyway, a beautiful song. Then you get to Carol's reworking of the song which made her career, the Shirelles' Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow in 1960. This is a really interesting version of the song and I totally recommend listening to the Shirelles version and then to the Carol King version. It's not sung in the way that I think the original song was intended, which is from the point of view of an anxious teenage girl who's worried about being loved and left and so on. It's the same lyrics, but it's very much the sound of a mature woman who is kind of cocking an eyebrow at her partner and being a little bit more cynical about the way the world works and yet not a cynical song, a very touching song. The next song is Smackwater Jack. It's unlike almost every other song on the album and it's not really a song about love and relationships. It's kind of a kind of a ballad of the old west, I guess. And so you could almost group it with songs like Steve Miller's Take the Money and Run, or Paul McCartney's Rocky Raccoon, or other songs of that ilk. The second last song on the album is Tapestry, the title track, and this is the only true solo track on the whole album, just Carol and the piano. The lyrics seem to get darker and darker. At the same time, the vocal delivery, to me, is suggesting a more upbeat outcome, and then at the end, there's this little sort of wistful coda, so unusual tune. The final song, is You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman, which is a second remaking of a song made very famous earlier on. Aretha, of course, like she did with everything that was written for her, made the song her own. And yet, I don't actually think that Carol falls short of the mark set by Aretha on this. The emotion here is so stark and so compelling and so raw. It's a brilliant lyric and it's from the heart. It's really the song of a mature woman celebrating the fact that she's in a relationship where her needs are being met, and yet it is not in any way a self-centered song. I think it's just really clever, a really moving lyric. It's an album that came out in 1971 that was not a message album, and yet it is a message album. 
It has very few, if any, overtly social or political lyrics. And yet, it's sung with the gaze of a woman who is defining the world in her own terms according to the things that she sees as being important in life, as opposed to interpreting life through the kind of madman lens of the Brill Building pop of the 1960s. And at the same time, it's an awesome pop album. It is crammed with great songs. It's crammed with great lyrics. It's crammed with great hooks. It's got wonderful players. You've got James Taylor and Joni Mitchell sitting in. It's a legendary album. There's no surprise that it made the impact it did, and absolutely it's five out of five.